Thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul. Whatever thou be, until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Lindsay. <laughs> I was going to bust out my alter ego, but I didn't think that Susie would should make a, a guest appearance here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks to everyone who has recently left ratings and reviews for us. Uh, nice to see them coming in as the new year begins. I know it's a slow time of the year for for horror, so we're happy to still get uh, new listeners and, and just uh, old listeners, you know, letting people know that you still like us. We appreciate it. That's cute. And uh, I know you have a charity announcement, and then after that, we're off and running. Yes, yes. So as you can imagine, in our podcasting community, we have a lot of long-haul truck drivers and then just, you know, everyday delivery drivers. And it has been sent into us multiple times. Could we please donate to Truckers Against Trafficking? So here we are, January donation, Truckers Against Trafficking, uh, better known as TAT. It's a 5013C that exists to educate, equip, empower, and mobilize members of the trucking, bus, and energy industries to combat human trafficking. If you'd like to learn more about what TAT is doing, or if you'd like to donate, or they have education opportunities, you can visit them at truckersagainsttrafficking.org. And we will be donating $12,900 to TAT while we're putting $1,440 into the scholarship fund. Great. And we've been getting some emails about the scholarship fund. Hang tight. We will be talking about that in the coming weeks, but just know that the application process will start again in March. We'll give you specifics on dates in the coming weeks. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, how many stories do you have today, Swedish P? Ah, Swedish P. <laughs> uh, well, Sweet P number one, I have three stories. My first story, okay, my first two stories, just as I was reading through options, comically are both about haunted restaurants. Both very different, really into both of them, especially having been a server and working in the, uh, the hospitality industry for so many years. And then in my third and final story, I ha it's... Maybe an attachment or maybe a haunted house. I'll let you decide what the problem is. What, where does it stem from? Okay. But but all really, really great stories this week. I'm looking forward to them. I mean, they're always great, but like I just especially love these ones this week. I have two. Uh, the first is a story of a convent in Milwaukee that reportedly experienced over a year's worth of paranormal activity in the mid-19th century. Then I'll share the Cajun legend of the Fuelier. A mysterious light from Louisiana folklore described as a mysterious and paranormal sinister force that leads people to their deaths. Lore and a modern encounter tale for that one. Okay. Well, you know, I love to go to Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So once you got your spoopy socks on and are cozied up on this dark winter day, I'll get started. Look at, look at I'm bringing some light. Oh my God. My thighs are really sore from working out. <laughs> uh, these are very sparkly pink socks with rose quartz on them. And I, they're like little party socks. <laughs> So fun. Okay. I'll, uh, while you got your party socks on, I'll, uh, I'll start here. Okay, party pants. Let's go. The School Sisters of Notre Dame, often referred to by their initials of SSND, is an international community of Catholic nuns dedicated to education, prayer, community life, and ministry. The SSND was founded in Bavaria, a German state that was once a kingdom back in 1833, and soon they spread outside of Bavaria. Several convents were established in and outside of Germany just a few years after their founding, the Roman Catholic institution, within just a few decades, would expand into 33 different countries. One of the earliest overseas convents was founded in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1851, and the school sisters would remain in that location for 109 years. Founder Mother Mary Carolyn Freiss arrived in Milwaukee accompanied by three sisters following receiving funding from King Ludwig of Bavaria to establish the Milwaukee Mother House. Over a century later, in 1958, the Milwaukee Journal would report, the sisters were a strange sight to Milwaukee's rough frontiersmen. It was chronicled that men jeered at them, and one tauntingly asked whether they had lost their husbands since they wore all black. Sister Mary Emanuel responded promptly, One man died for all of us, and only for him do we mourn. The sisters originally lived in a four-room house that was once home to a Presbyterian minister. 
At the time, Milwaukee was nothing more than forest primeval, dotted with a few frame houses separated by ravines and knolls, according to the website On Milwaukee. By 1868, the nuns had expanded into a massive convent that spanned a full city block, covering Ogden Avenue, Milwaukee Street, and Knapp Street. The convent was called a city unto itself. The convent also served as a finishing school for girls from elite families. At one point, they had over 400 students. The sisters were fully self-sufficient. They acted as chefs, gardeners, bakers, seamstresses, printers, musicians, etc. They were able to house students, boarders, and over 150 nuns. And then, in 1854, they may have also housed a demon. Time now for the tale of the devil in the convent. Mother Caroline was running the Milwaukee convent as usual when paranormal activity disrupted her and the other sisters' peaceful lives. On the night of December 8, 1854, Mother Caroline said she was alone in the chapel when she heard the sound of claws scurrying across the floor behind her, like a small animal was running through the room. But where was this creature? She couldn't spot anything making the distinct noises she so clearly heard. The unseen creature came closer and closer to her, and then the sound of its scurrying transformed into a series of loud knocking sounds. A moment later, all the windows around her started to shake, and now a nun ran in to tell Mother Caroline that something was going on in the students' dorms. The sisters assumed someone had broken in. Mother Caroline and the nuns proceeded to search the halls for any intruders, which was difficult. They struggled to see clearly because their oil lamps and candles kept refusing to light. And when the candles did light, they would be snuffed out almost immediately. Moonlight coming in from the windows was their only consistent source of illumination. They searched and searched, but found no intruder. But they did notice something unusual in the girls' dorm, something described as a muddy slush on their pillows. Mother Caroline was concerned, but she didn't want to frighten the girls, so she pretended it was nothing more than a prank. According to the paranormal site American Ghost Walks, what she had thought was slush didn't act like it was made from water. It neither soaked through the pillowcases nor poured from them when tipped. The girls' nightcaps were also filled with the same strange fluid. The girls' nightcaps had all been turned upside down and lined up along a bedside table. And Mother Caroline would claim that, as she tried to figure out what this slush could possibly be, she saw one of the nightcaps begin to dance around on its own. Mother Caroline had a feeling that these new supernatural occurrences were directly related to what she had just experienced when she was in the chapel. Strange activity continued the following day. The call bell started ringing on its own in the middle of the night. The nuns wondered how this was possible. The call bell was kept in a locked room, and only Mother Caroline had the key. But she was standing outside the room with them when it happened, just as confused as they were. Once M Mother Caroline and some other sisters entered the room, they watched the bell lift off the shelf and fly across the room, as if someone had thrown it. Clearly, powerful supernatural forces were at work in their convent. What were these forces, and why were they suddenly active now? More strange events kept occurring, one after another, in rapid succession. Altar candles disappeared during Mass and were later found burning in a broom closet. This was reportedly witnessed by numerous women. Prayer services were interrupted by the sounds of pots and pans flying around in the kitchen. The nuns then found the kitchenware tossed around on the floor, extremely hot to the touch. Numerous articles of clothing were found ripped by what looked like a large animal's claws. Other unusual but less ominous activity included loaves of bread disappearing from the oven and ending up in the well, and a fish dinner transforming into a beef dinner inside the oven. The nuns and students reported invisible hands hitting their ears hard enough to knock their veils off. Their house dog also yelped as if he was being hit. Perhaps the worst, most, most unbearable phenomena was the bestial wailing that women kept hearing at night. The noise sounded like the screams of a dying pig. Making all this so much harder to bear, the nuns and the students were soon suffering from sleep deprivation due to this activity going on night after night, month after month, and worsening in severity as time passed. Soon, Mother Caroline began to notice dark shadows throughout the convent, dark moving shadows that she kept seeing in the corners of her vision, lurking around and watching, but disappearing half a moment after staring directly at them. Not long after these shadows first started to appear, the convent's resident dog went missing, and when the dog's remains were later discovered, it appeared that the dog had been gored by a great beast. The sisters were, of course, continually searching and praying to find the cause of these strange events, but for months, no clue could be found. 
Finally, they got their first lead when dirty water started dripping from across the ceiling onto all of the convent students' beds, all of them except one. Not long before this, Mother Caroline began noticing that this same student who slept in this bed had begun to abruptly laugh a bit in an odd manner every time she entered the chapel. Mother Caroline began to suspect that everything they had been experiencing was somehow connected to this young woman. She looked into the convent's records and remembered that the girl had come to the convent to escape an arranged marriage. When one of the sisters confronted the girl about why her bed had been spared and why she'd started to laugh when she entered the chapel, she began laughing again, and she said she had been cursed and would remain cursed for as long as she remained in the convent. Her parents had promised her to a man she didn't know, and when she did meet him, she knew immediately she didn't want to marry him, and she ran away to join the convent to avoid that fate. But before she ran away, he cursed her, a curse that he said would remain as long as she stayed in the convent. At least, this is what she professed to believe. She also admitted to Mother Caroline that she had seen the devil inside the convent, and that now the devil was tormenting her. Mother Caroline suspected that the girl had never been cursed, but rather had become demonically possessed. She shared her thoughts with Father Urbanek, the convent's priest. John Martin Henney, the Bishop of Milwaukee, recommended that the girl be dismissed from the convent instead of receiving an exorcism, even though she had asked the church for refuge. And although this was not the outcome that Mother Caroline had wanted, this is what happened. The girl was given no more refuge by the church and was instead banished. Oh my gosh. After she left, all the demonic activity they'd been experiencing for a full 13 months up until that point stopped. It was over, at least for the convent, it was over. Not much is known about the girl following her departure. How much more torment did she endure? Did she ever receive an exorcism? Did her possession continue? Did something follow her to another location that then went on to become haunted? As far as the public knows, this was the only time that dark forces were witnessed at work in the convent. The nuns resumed living peaceful private lives and would continue to do so for many years. Mother Caroline would die in 1892. After her death, the nuns became more private and secluded from public life. By late 1950, or by the late 1950s, the convent was terribly run down. It had not been renovated since 1893, and they moved into a new complex in McQuan, 18 miles away. It would be called Notre Dame on the Lake. A wrecking company sold over 300,000 square feet of flooring, ironwork, steel fixtures, and crystal chandeliers from the original convent. Demolition of the original convent started on September 15, 1959. The city block would be cleared by March of 1960, and it would become affordable housing for the elderly and was named Convent Hill as a tribute to the original building. The Notre Dame on the Lake convent was eventually sold in October of 1982 and now is part of the campus of Concordia University, Wisconsin. The school sisters moved again to Wauwatosa, where they are still active today and, as far as we know, still free from being paranormally tormented. Huh. <clears throat> I, I find that story really bothersome because if you were going through, if you were cursed, if you like were seeking help, yeah. Most oftentimes we think to immediately go to some religious entity. We uh -huh. go to a priest. We don't frequently say like, oh, find a nun, but it's the same kind of idea, you know, that this safe place, this yeah. this pure place that is so full of like hope and prayer and safety. And then to be booted out of there. I know. That's really fucked. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's yeah. a bummer that when I mean, bummer in the sense that like they were right that when that girl left, the activity stopped. But like, I don't know, my conscience would be like, oh, okay, it really was her. So now I want to go find her and exercise her. Mm -hmm. As opposed to just being like, eh, sorry. Let's get her out of here. She's a problem. You're Right. Your issue now. She's hysterical. Get her out of here. Oh, she's hysterical. Mm -hmm. Are you going to bring that back in 2024 to start calling women hysterical? J just anytime they do something that you don't like? God. Wow, she's hysterical. There would be a contingency of people that would really love that. I think- Yeah, it, incels. <laughs> I could be like the I'll be the hysterical chick mm -hmm. or the hysterical broad. Yeah. Uh my God. That would be so fascinating to create like <laughs> oh a fake God. Instagram account and just talk about hysterical women. I mean it wouldn't it, it be would get, it would get too popular. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that would be infuriating to be that person to be on the receiving end. If just like every time that you just do anything that irritates me, I'm like, okay, you're being a little hysterical. Okay, well, that's gaslighting, right? I think that's like the definition oh, that is, of oh, gaslighting. Oh, that's right. When you tell somebody they're doing something they're not. Yeah, it's like, mm -hmm. why are you being crazy? You're, you're, <laughs> you're being crazy. Yeah. Like, there is no better way to, to fire feel. somebody up. Woof. Mm -hmm. yeah. And usually it's like when you have done something terrible. So let's just say in some hypothetical world, mm -hmm. we're a different couple. 
and you have cheated on me and mm -hmm. I know it, mm -hmm. but I've also cheated mm -hmm. and you don't, and you're doing this like weird thing of like, what did you do? And you're like, I didn't do anything. What did you, do? you know, and uh -huh, you do that uh -huh. like game where it's like, you're just pushing it on someone else. Another, another phrase like that, that really is just, uh, when you're, when you're not being that worked up, just be like, calm down, sir. That's another one's like, what? I, I, I was, I was calm. Now, now I'm, I'm not, now I'm definitely not calm. Also, I very rarely hear calm down, sir. It's generally, okay, ma'am, let's calm down. Well, for me, it would be. Yeah, I, I know, but generally people don't tell men to calm down. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty annoying. All right, you're being a little hysterical. Uh, no, you know what? You're right. <laughs> you're right. Okay, I have some pictures. This first one, a photo of Mother Caroline from uh, the late 19th century. I have a weird fascination with nuns. Mm -hmm. They just like, they seem like very peaceful people. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. When, when, I, when I see like a, a young nun, uh, honestly, my reaction is like, I feel sorry for you. Really? Yeah. Oh, I, th I think like, who hurt you? Right, right. Like, like what, oh. what made you think that you just couldn't like, I, I look at like you're hiding from something. Why did you oh. feel like you had to, to, I mean, I guess it could just be you're just that faithful. Yeah, devout. But yeah, I guess just since I'm not, I, it's just hard for me to relate. I'm just yeah. like, man, there's so many fun things you could do. Like, really? Just You just don't ever want sex? That that's the one fun thing they can't do. I think. No, they, no. I think there's a lot of fun things they can't do. Like what? Drugs, else? right? Sex, uh, travel on their own. Uh, they, I, I see nuns in airports all the time. I think they gotta get it approved. I don't think you get to like wing it. You you don't get to go like out to the bar if you're like you know what I'm not feeling the convent tonight. I'm gonna go have some drinks and throw some fucking darts. Whoa. You know that's not that's not an option. I think because my I don't know how what her. My grandfather's sister was a nun and mm -hmm. we would go and like visit yeah. her. I don't know. You know what? It seemed I, great. I mean, if they're happy, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, yeah. if that's what makes you happy, then go for it. I never see a sad nun. Got to tell you. Out in public, man, mm. they are cheery. Maybe. Yeah, maybe they're on to something. I like nuns. And maybe, and maybe they're having lots of sex. With themselves? And each other. Could be, <laughs> all, could be all kinds of stuff going on in that convent. I guess. There is some sort of like, it's not a, they call it a convent. Where is it? Mm -hmm. Oh man, I'm gonna have to go down a rabbit hole after this. But it's just like women my age, yeah. you know, who just have kind of said like, ah, fuck it, and they just go and live it's like a commune, but not in like a creepy culty way. Like you can huh. come and go, whatever. Yeah. But it's only women, and I, it's like you you, it, you probably don't go for your whole life. You it would just be like go in like <laughs> you know like restoration from maybe you know you experience something terrible. It would or, be like if Curves Gyms just became a full functioning compound. Do you know that Kyler has a series of Curves Gym t-shirts that he has <laughs> that thrifted? That sounds right. That sounds right. Um, They're like some, like some sort of like competition. Like he has like 100, 200, 300. I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, this next picture, the original school of uh, school sisters of Notre Dame convent before it was demolished. So big, big building. And yeah, also like a full city block. Beautiful. Uh-huh. Like what is that? Four stories, maybe five if there's a big basement. Um, yeah. This next one, uh, the demonic nun, Valak. From The Conjuring 2. And I realized there was no possessed nuns in the story, but I just heard like a story about devil, nuns, yeah. and I was like, oh, made me think of this. But of course, Yee. she's not a happy nun. She's, no, she's not a happy nun. She's not the kind of nuns I, I think of. Mm -mm. Yeah. And where are all the nuns anymore? Like really, I don't really hear a lot of talk about nuns. I see them at the airport sometimes. But, that, but that's it. Are uh, they just putting them there to reassure us that nuns still exist? <laughs> this uh, this next picture, same entity. This, this time from the movie, The Nun. Just, ooh, that's such a good creepy character. Look at those teeth. And then, and then this next one, some creepy AI rendition of a demonic nun called Demon, Demon Nun 3, found on uh, DeviantArt.com, created by user ERTUGRUL196714. Um, I, I love that AI, Logan and I were just talking about this. It was probably done like within the last few months. Because of the hands. Uh huh. They just, I love that AI currently can't get the hands right. Like, it are these amazing faces that look so lifelike, but the right, her right hand, her hands are too small. And her right hand has six fingers. One, two. Wait, what? Uh, oh, you know what? Shoot, it didn't show up in this cropping. When I, when I grabbed the picture, oh, that's a bummer. It got cut off some, for some reason with, with our displayer. But she has uh, six fingers and no thumb on her right hand. Well, maybe that's part of her charm. Yeah. Maybe that's Ooh, Maybe it's her... intentional. It was like, that's how she's demonic. Uh -huh. And then this last one, just a, a one more pick of Lack. Uh, I, just, I think it's a great horror image. Man, imagine seeing that at the end of the Oh, <gasps> Right? What is that from? From The Nun. I didn't see that movie and oh God. Creepy. It's the white, the whited out face. Mm. That like in the narrow hallway where that, that's what creeps me out, where it's like you can't squeeze past that thing. It's you can't well, get around it. 
Well, right. Also, I think that's the end of a hallway, so. Yeah, I'm just saying it's a narrow hallway. It, well, oh, it's, right. I'm it's saying thin. it's the end, so you wouldn't be going past it anyways because there's no, nothing beyond her. Got it, got it. Um, but yeah. A narrow hallway, I'm, I don't know why that doesn't bother me. Huh. It does look like there's bars at the end. I mean, I know it's just the wallpaper, mm -hmm. but it's like a good visual. It's a good choice. Good job, art department. You did well. Good job. Um, okay, you're talking about finishing school. Uh -huh. Do you know anybody that went to finishing school? Yeah, most of my friends went to finishing school. <laughs> I went to finishing school. You did? Uh -huh. Where did you attend finishing school? Um, Paris. Oh. Paris, Paris, as I would call it. <laughs> I went to Paris. You did? Uh-huh. I went to the Paris finishing school. When I lived in for LA. Good, for good boys. <laughs> for good boys who go pee pee on a potty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I was in LA, I had a friend who sent her son to Cotillion, yeah. I, I believe is what it's called. And it's like, and it's not, you don't live there. It's just like a once a week or twice a week thing, but it's essentially finishing school. Like they huh. learn how to. Um, what the salad fork is. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And like how to like properly dance uh -huh. and like a how to ask a girl to dance. Like I, it was fascinating to me. They taught us all, yeah, all kinds, all, all that stuff, like all every kind of etiquette you can imagine. Really, mm -hmm. even even things you wouldn't even think of that would be like a part of etiquette, like um, like a like a more sophisticated, uh, proper masturbation technique. Oh, it, it's pinkies out. <laughs> uh huh. That's why I've always done that ever since. Uh, <laughs> that is an incredible <laughs> visual. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And back posture, back straight. Mm hmm. S a slight smile, but nothing crazy. And you gotta, you know. You're going to be some breathing, but nothing nothing too much. Mm -hmm. Like uh, measured breathing. Mm -hmm. And then when you're done, you bow. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> you say, good day, sir. And then, yeah. I want a t-shirt. Okay. That just says, finishing school. Because, <laughs> I mean, you're, yeah. gonna, you're about to show them step by step how to finish. Yeah, how to finish. Pinky's out. Pinky's out. Slight Back smile. Back straight. Slight smile. Like, good day, sir. Like a comic strip. <laughs> Okay, you ready to uh, move away from this nonsense and to explore yes. what I, made... I, I did like that story. I love the setting of that story. Yeah. Not not a terribly terrifying story. I feel bad yeah. for that girl. But I do love the setting <coughs> of uh, a convent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you're in New Orleans, go to the Peter and Paul. It's a great hotel. Great, great, great hotel. They have good rates. And uh, it's a former convent, schoolhouse, and church that has been converted into yeah, it's very a, cool. a, a different space. Okay. Now we head to Louisiana to explore what may hide in the swamps. Decent amount of folklore to explore on this one. And uh, a mention of some supposed sightings before I tell the alleged modern encounter. The Fieu Fillier is a mysterious light from Cajun folklore described as a paranormal sinister force that leads people to their deaths. The phrase Fieu Fillier is French and translates to marsh fire or crazy fire. The Acadians, who were exiled to modern-day Louisiana from what is now the maritime provinces of Northeast Canada in the 18th century, created the phrase. These original Cajuns passed down stories of the fuel filier from one generation to the next, claiming that they saw glowing lights in the darkness of the swamps around them, lights that tried to lead them astray. Various stories describe it differently, but the fuel filier typically said to be about the size of a candle flame. A little flickering ball of light dances around in the night sky on the bayou. Some believe that the fuel fuelier is the spirit of a deceased loved one saying their last goodbye. Others believe the fuel fuelier is an evil spirit meant to distract and lure unsuspecting people down into the swamp or deep into the swamp where they'll become lost or drown. There are legends that the fuel fuelier, fuel it's not an easy word, is connected to a famous pirate like William Kidd or Jean Lafitte who believed that it was necessary to kill a crew member when burying treasure so that the dead man's spirit could watch over and protect it. Once the treasure was later retrieved, their spirit was freed and then transformed into the few fuelier. Another legend says that in Acadiana, there was a blacksmith by the name of Will Smith. Ha! <laughs> Did he get slapped? And, no, no, he would have slapped somebody else uh, who passed away. Once he meets St. Peter at the pearly gates, he's given a second chance at life, and then he lives this life in a very wicked fashion, so wicked that once he dies the second time, he meets the devil. And the devil dooms him to wander the earth forever as a spirit with only a single burning piece of coal to warm himself. And now he uses that light to lure people to their death in the swamp. Parents in certain parts of Louisiana have warned their children for generations never to follow these lights or they will meet an early death. Is that all the fuel fuelier is? A boogeyman invented by parents to keep their children away from the very much of this world dangers found in the swamp? Some folklore? 
perhaps. But if that's true, why have sightings of the fuel fuel yake occurred outside of the swamps and bayous? Why do sightings continue up until this day when parents no longer tell these tales to their children? For example, for example, the fuel fuel yake has been reportedly spotted at the Bilbo Cemetery in Lake Charles, Louisiana, ever since the 1840s. Not a remotely swampy area. Also, a group of friends exploring the country near Gonzales, Louisiana, just a few years ago, claimed they saw a group of colorful lights floating along a dirt road. And rather than trying to lure them off the road and out into the swamp, the lights pursued them, growing bigger as they came closer and forcing the group to flee in a panic. In recent years, scientists have sought a natural explanation for this phenomenon. Since most of the alleged sightings have occurred from a great distance, some researchers have assumed that people simply weren't close enough to see what was really happening and thus have no idea what they were actually witnessing. Sometimes scientists have attributed the swamp lights to phosphorescence caused by the combustion of natural gases like methane. Swamps and bogs are full of water that is low in oxygen. Bacteria and microorganisms consume dead plants and release methane and phosphine gas, and phosphine gas can produce light during combustion. Other scientists attribute the lights to bioluminescence, the biochemical emission of light by living organisms, such as fireflies. It can also be caused by decay. Some bacteria on decaying meat or fish will emit a ghostly glow. Still, for many, uh, these explanations simply don't explain what they believe they've witnessed, and a belief in the old stories of the few filiers persists. If the dancing lights seen out on the swamp are in fact evil spirits, actively trying to lead people to their death. The following story comes from a blog. The writer claims that their missing family member was a victim of the few filiers. Time now for the tale of the few filiers. I'd known about the few filiers since I was a little boy. Growing up, my whole family would sit around a bonfire and listen to my grandfather as he entertained us with tall tales. And in one of these tales, he'd claim he'd seen the few filier plenty of times when he was out on the bayou late at night. He described how it lured him the first time he saw it, how without thinking, he'd put his boat in drive and slowly approached, only realizing what was happening at the last second. He noticed that he was now at the very edge of his normal route through the bayou, about to veer off into a vast wilderness he had never before dared to explore. From that time on, he always turned around whenever he spotted the few filier. I believed him when I was young. I used to think that lightning bugs I saw during our boat rides were the few filier trying to lure us out into our deaths. But my grandfather assured me that what we were seeing was indeed just lightning bugs, that the few filier were different, and that I would know it if I saw it. My grandfather died when I was 10. We were especially close, and I missed the time we'd spent hunting and fishing together. My Uncle Tommy stepped in and tried to fill my grandfather's role in the family. Tommy was the one who took over the family bonfires, sharing stories and funny memories from the past. He was the one who organized family hunting trips with my dad and his siblings. And he taught me everything my grandfather hadn't already taught me about hunting and fishing. Losing Tommy hurt even more than losing my grandfather. At least I knew what happened to my grandpa. He had died of a heart attack. Tommy, he just disappeared. I was 15 when it happened. It was a Friday night the summer before my sophomore year of high school. Tommy had organized a now yearly frog hunt. We were going to catch and sell as many as we could that night and save some for ourselves to make frog legs. I remember the night wasn't going how I hoped it would. My parents were recently separated and my dad had been drinking a lot more. Whenever I was staying with my dad, I saw him finish at least a six pack each night. I had no idea how much he was drinking when I wasn't there. We had dinner at Tommy's house before we headed out on the water for the night, and I watched my dad drink eight beers. I'd counted. Tommy tried to tap him on the shoulder and hint that he needed to slow down, but my dad shrugged him off. He was good and drunk by the time we were ready to leave. I was supposed to ride with Tommy that night, but before we got into our boats, he took me aside and said, Hey kid, I think you need to ride with your dad tonight. He's going to need a little help driving the boat. I was disappointed. Tommy was my hero back then. All I wanted was to spend time with him, but my dad really did need my help. My Uncle Saul had two young kids with him. It was me or Tommy, and I knew that while Tommy had organized the frog hunt as a fun family outing, he also needed some extra cash. He took this pretty seriously and couldn't babysit my dad all night. Reluctantly, I got into the boat with my dad. He wasn't completely wasted, but he was nowhere near sober. He couldn't be trusted to drive anything, much less a boat in the middle of the bayou. The first hour passed uneventfully. I navigated following my uncle and trying to be as quiet as possible so as not to scare the frogs away. The bayou is especially eerie when it gets dark. The air is filled with the chattering calls of all the critters that only come out at night. And I didn't want to think about what might be in the water below us. 
some point, Tommy idled up alongside my dad and I and said, I'm going to go up a ways on my own. You and your dad all right here? My dad was leaning back on the bench seat. He'd sobered up and we'd caught about 10 frogs. Not nearly as many as I'd hoped. I wanted to go with Tommy, but I knew he'd tell me no, so I said, Yeah. Tommy promised to meet us in about an hour. I watched as he drove off into the dark, muggy night. Pretty soon it was 1 a.m. We'd been frog hunting for over three hours now. Tommy was supposed to have returned by that time, but he still wasn't back yet. I couldn't see his light anywhere nearby. By 1.30, my dad was starting to get a worried look on his face. He'd stopped looking for frogs and was instead shining his flashlight around the bayou, searching for signs of Tommy. My Uncle Saul and his kids joined us to wait for him. None of us had a cell phone back then. We had no way to get in touch with him outside of shouting his name. So we waited. We shouted his name and we waited. Pretty soon it was almost 3 a.m. Everyone was worried about Tommy. Real world worried. My dad broke what had become a long, tense silence, telling my Uncle Saul, take the kids back. Adam and I will look for him. I could tell Saul didn't want to leave, but he needed to get his kids home. My dad's face was grim as he now took over the wheel. We both knew how dangerous the bayou could be during the day. It was worse, a completely different beast at night. Still, Tommy knew this area well. He'd been boating these routes since he was a boy, but a sinister voice in my mind whispered that accidents can happen to anybody. My dad and I drove around until our gas ran dangerously low and we were forced to turn back. Dad called the police when he got home, and then we headed right back out after putting some gas in the boat. Dad told me I should stay home and sleep, but I begged to return and help look for Tommy. I'll never forget how hopeless the search and rescue officers looked as they set out that morning. My dad and I came with them to help retrace Tommy's route and look for any of his belongings that might have fallen into the water. We found his boat after two hours of searching. It was floating in a wide channel surrounded by thick woods. I recognized the place because Tommy and I had been through that same channel many times. Tommy knew this area so well, he didn't even have to think about navigating. The fact that his boat was just floating there without him in it was deeply upsetting. We searched up and down the channel for hours. Looking for my uncle was one of the most dreadful experiences I've ever had. I was terrified we'd find his dead body floating face down in the water. The search and rescue team scoured the swamp day after day. They got out of the boats and hiked around the woods but could find no trace of him. They didn't even find any footprints on any muddy banks. All his personal items were still in the boat. His flashlight, his ID and hunting license, cigarettes, lighter, his hat, and most concerning, his handgun and hunting knife. It was like Uncle Tommy had vanished into thin air. The search for him would continue for five days, and then they'd call it off. His case was covered on a few local news outlets, and then that was that. At least for the police and media it was. My dad and I searched every day that summer. My Uncle Saul searched most of the summer as well. At a certain point, I think we all knew we would never find him. And even if by some miracle we did find him, I knew he wouldn't be alive. I accepted that outcome, but still had so many questions. Why him? Why such a good guy? It wasn't fair that I lost the person I looked up to the most. Again, first my grandfather, now Uncle Tommy. How could someone like Tommy, an experienced outdoorsman, get lost in the bayou he'd grown up in? If Tommy died by an accident, why didn't we find his body by now? Or did something get to him before we did? And then there was this other possibility lingering in the back of my mind. I thought of the few filiers. The more I considered it, the more it started to make sense. Tommy was an idiot, and he wasn't prideful. If he knew he was lost, he would have started shouting for help. That's what he always told me. Call out to your group. If he was attacked by an alligator, we probably would have heard him scream or possibly heard a gunshot if he was able to grab his weapon in time. I knew Tommy. He wouldn't have quietly wandered off by himself to explore a new channel, and there was no evidence he was went out into the woods. It was like he disappeared from the water, but Tommy never went swimming at night. He always said it was way too risky. The rare times I'd seen him fall out of the boat... He jumped right back in, not eager to make contact with whatever creatures were in the dark water around him. I never talked about it with anybody, but I came to firmly believe that Tommy saw the fuel filier on the night he went missing. Those lights distracted him, lured him out into the water, made him so lost and confused we could never find him. My family stopped talking about Tommy. His memory became a silent shadow, one that was always lurking around us. It was just too painful for them to speak about him, but I still thought about him every day. Over two decades later, when I was well into my 30s, I was out late one night frog hunting with my Uncle Saul and my cousins, who were now young adults. My dad, who had bad joints by now, who had bad joints by now, didn't feel like uh, heading out. But my uncle and I wanted to keep Tommy's tradition going as long as we could, even if we didn't talk about him. I was alone on my small boat when it happened. 
about midway through the night, I decided to go off my own for a while. I always think of Tommy when I'm alone in the water, and that night was no different. At some point, I lost focus of what I was supposed to be doing and sat in my boat. I was sitting there, staring out into the darkness, my eyes starting to lose focus when I saw them. Three blinking lights. I instantly perked up and squinted to try to see them better. I knew they weren't lightning bugs. I wouldn't have been able to see them from so far away. It couldn't have been a gator's eye shine, neither. It was too high up to be that. I checked my surroundings and noticed that I had drifted over to the entrance of the channel where we found Tommy's boat all those years ago. The lights were floating deep out into the woods, barely a flicker off into the distance. As I sat in my boat and stared at them, an overwhelming urge came over me to follow those lights. For a few moments, I was convinced they would lead me to Tommy, that we would finally get the answers we'd been seeking and could lay him to rest and give him a proper burial. Realization of what was really happening kicked in right before I'd driven too far towards those lights to make it back to a path I knew with certainty. I understood exactly what was happening. If I had kept driving towards those lights, I wouldn't have found anything. I would have gotten lost and probably disappeared forever, just like Tommy. I turned around, making sure I didn't look back even once as I returned to my family. As I headed back, I was overcome with so many different emotions. I felt spooked, grateful, sad, and relieved all at the same time. While there would be no point in telling my family what had happened, I don't think they would have believed me. At least now I knew for sure what had happened to Uncle Tommy. The fuel fuel yay had taken him, and we were never going to find him. Ugh, swamps are so freaking scary. I know, they really are. Swamps at night, especially. Just period. Mm -hmm. Like, the first time we went to New Orleans, we took the kids on one of those, like, uh, swamp tours, you mm -hmm. know, and you're in, like, a special kind of, it's not a, I forget what kind of that boat is called. I know, I can picture it perfectly in my mind, and I can't remember what like it's called. Like, metal, and... Mm -hmm. It has almost like a big fan on the back. And I was going to say an airboat, but I don't think that's what it's called. It's, yeah, it's like meant for real. Sh it can go through uh, very it. shallow. It's not a pontoon boat either, yeah. but it's kind of an like. Would you say an airboat? That's what I said. Yeah, is it that might what it's be. called? An airboat is a flat-bottomed watercraft propelled by an aircraft-type propeller. I think so. I, I think, think that's so. it. The pictures look like yeah, going through the bayou. Okay. 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 okay yeah. Yeah. They, they don't. They don't sink very far down into the water. I was trying to think of that term too. I'm terrible with like nautical terms. Yeah. But there's a term for like how far beneath the water surface your boat dips. Uh huh. Uh huh. And, and those boats like barely at all. Their their weight is really evenly dis distributed. So like you know, I think they can go into something like a foot of water. Something crazy. Boats are kind of fascinating to me in that way. I think my brain just doesn't completely understand the um engineering of it and mm -hmm. then just like the science behind it because even when you look at just like uh you know like a 25 foot boat yeah it's really not as deep in the water as you would think like mm -hmm. if you drew me a picture of a boat and said like this boat is going in the water i would assume that the lower half the entire lower half is going yeah. under no it's like, it's a couple like feet a yeah it's wild mm -hmm. i don't they don't tip over i mean obviously they can but like yeah i am fascinated by that yeah I have a few pictures, uh, just two. Uh, uh, here, actually, no, I have three. Here's a depiction of what the fuel fuelier might look like. This is an illustration found on pelicansatamine.com. Okay, well, that's beautiful. Uh huh. I mean, I, it is really pretty. Like, yeah, I wouldn't want to go out in there, but no, at the bayou at night. No, 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 There's no. The no, lights no. really pretty. And then this next one, just a, a picture of the bayou at night. I mean, how would you like to see a a, <gasps> a ghost out there or something? A ghost, a gator, a wild boar. Like just mm -hmm. nope. And look, and just the water is so dark. It's like what's in that water? So much. All the things I just said. Uh -huh. And then finally, uh, this is the monster found in the bayou that we didn't just talk about. Swamp ass. Okay. Mm hmm. Dangerous one. Is that your butt? It, sometimes. Mm hmm. The humidity. If the humidity gets just right, it sure is. Ugh. Ooh, swamp ass. Fair enough. Okay. Thank, thank you for that yeah. very educational photo. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all really needed that in our lives. You're supposed to put like um, like a powder. Uh, I when I went to finishing school, yes, to avoid swamp ass, they would talk about like putting powder in your in your underwear, hmm. like mm -hmm. like powdered like baby sugar. Like baby, no, like uh, no, no baby powder. Obviously. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you didn't go to finishing school, so I thought you might have actually believed that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's good that I asked. Such mm -hmm. an important question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you, yeah. And if you have any etiquette, etiquette questions, I'm your guy. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. so. I'm very, I'm very refined. Uh, the word that gets thrown around mostly about me is refined. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That guy's refined. Uh-huh. Yeah. Gentleman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That guy's a gentleman. Yeah. A refined, sometimes they will add that to refined. He's a refined gentleman. Yeah, I think sometimes they say like he's very well put together. He's mm -hmm. buttoned up. Dignified. 
dignified. The guy seems dignified is another yeah. thing I get a lot. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. the, the, the rest of the adjectives really escaped me. We, but, I, but I, I, learned, I learned a lot of that. We had a whole adjective course in finishing school in Paris. In Paris. I was thinking like you sort of remind me of the kind of guys that you see in like uh, – Oh, what's that movie? Esqu oh, I was just guess like a magazine like Esquire, but go ahead. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. But uh oh I had it. I I can't remember. And if you know, if my brain worked as well as yours, like My if, Fair Lady? No, no, oh. no, 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 no. More modern movie. Uh and they all wear like the really beautiful, well put together suits. Ocean's Eleven? Well, there is that. Kingsman? The, like the Kingsman. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that. I studied that movie at finishing school. Obviously, minus all of the like murder and things that go on, but just. Oh, no, you learn how to do murder and stuff, but in like a dignified way. Like oh, yeah, a with graceful like, way. In the, like the darts and swords and stuff. Stars. Nothing, yeah. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Wow. Like karate moves and stuff. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like, but like, like karate mixed with like ballet. So it's yeah. Like a real graceful. You don't want to look sloppy. Th that's why I said it was beautiful. Yep. I, mm -hmm. I, I thought in my mind about you moving. I would, I would have fluidly. said fluidly. Mm -hmm. I would have said exquisite, but that's the difference between a person who goes to finishing school and a person who doesn't go to finishing school. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for taking pity on me. You bet. Yeah. Now I have a few things I'd like to say about this story. Okay. Um. First of all, very important thing. If you're in New Orleans, make sure you go to Lafitte's and get purple drink. Mm -hmm. Only have one. You will be messed up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we were Some in- Everclear in there. Oh my gosh. My brother and I were in New Orleans the first week of December. And we, I was like, okay, you got to get purple drink. So I took them. It's like a purple slushy, And it's, you know, it's, it's potent. And we were like, oh, we're fine. We're fine. We each got one. We didn't want to share. And we walked- from the quarter to the garden district. There were just some things that whatever we were. And by the time we walked, I don't know, a mile and a half, we yeah. were blitzed. So uh, be careful, but it's so fun. Uh, I, would, I would never be drunk in public. Okay. And then um, moving on. No. Okay. About Uncle Tommy. Do, what do you think the possibility is, is that Uncle Tommy took his own life? That he... Died by suicide. Mm. That he just dove into that bayou knowing full, like, to, like mean, could, took all of his belongings. Because I was thinking, like, that is a, a for sure fire way to die. It's to just yeah. dive into a fucking bayou. Because, I mean, the alligators are going to get you. For sure. I mean, they're not yeah. going to take it easy on you. I mean, that'd be a crazy way to take yourself out. Yeah. With alligators. But, I, mean, I mean, people do. I mean, it is one of those things, sadly, where it's like... um Sometimes people don't leave clues. That's what they say. It's like yeah. so uh, maddening about, you know, for the survivors. About death by suicide. Mm -hmm. yeah. In some cases where they're like, there, there weren't any clues or the person wouldn't reveal anything. So, I mean, I guess it's always a possibility. Right. But it sure, it sure seems remote in, yeah. this, in this example because it sounds like he was a love and life. And, but I guess, yeah, but I guess you never know what people are dealing with internally. Absolutely. Well, I think that, that, but, then why, but then why would the body turn up? That, that's what he would kind of well, reference. Because the alligators would have eaten it. Yeah, but like clothes or something. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, Some, that's, yeah, something. I, I, do you think that alligators like delicately undress the body? We had a few alligators at finishing school. You did? With us. And they would do that. They would like, they were taught to like, you know, take off the shirt, unbutton it, mm -hmm. like really kind of present it, lay it out, fold the clothes. Wow. Put them on a little piece of bog and then like eat things and then stack the bones up in a little oh, pile, like a like, respectful nice. way. Yeah. When they're yeah. done eating somebody. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yep. And okay, my last question is, will an alligator, uh, without being provoked, will it attack a boat? Do you know? Because all I could think about- I don't about, think so. I, I, I actually, I mean, not having grown up in the South and not yeah. like spending a ton of time down there, I don't really know a lot about alligators and their tendencies. Yeah. And, right, Most of them aren't actually that big. Seriously. Oh, there's alligators and then the the giant one then crocodiles. is the crocodile. Yeah. I mean, there's some big there's some big. In my mind, they're the sure. same thing. Like, which is- uh, Crocodiles are quite a bit bigger. But they, if you were just looking at like their heads, just in a photo, okay. You could tell them apart. You could? Truly. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Because they um, look very different or just by size? Mm, just different, like different looks too. Like as far as how many little ridges and stuff they have on the tops of their heads and stuff. They, they have a different look. You probably learned that at finishing school. No, I just, I read that on my own. But, you did? Yeah. So wow. I, I, I have learned something since. You have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. Are you ready for, well, well anyway, so you don't think yeah. that gators will just provoke, uh, they're not provoked, uh, I'm sorry, they don't attack unless provoked. I don't think so. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, I don't know a lot about them, so. 
but I was just thinking about how scary it would be to be out in the bayou just on a... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> God, I was holding on for as long as I could. I, I couldn't take it anymore. Ah. Yeah. No, please carry on with your fishing school. It's not, it's not very comfortable to sit that way, actually. Uh, if you don't normally watch the show, yeah. I would suggest going to YouTube and finding about the 45-minute mark. Uh, maybe go to the 40-minute mark, and you can see Dan really just like popping out pinkies and just me really trying to hold it together <laughs> uh, to not lose character here. Um, but no, so, okay, so alligators generally will just leave people alone unless provoked. I, I just don't know a lot about their like behavior patterns. Yeah, they go after like smaller prey than human. I mean, it is actually pretty rare that they go like attack a human. Okay. I mean, they might, but so it's I'm, like- I'm just what, trying what, to understand like, like, mm -hmm. like did, did like one bump into Tommy's boat? Did Tommy, did Tommy fall out? Like, I don't, I'm trying yeah, to, I don't I, know. Yeah. I have a lot of alligator questions. I'm, I'm probably not the best guy to answer all those questions. My, my depth of alligator attack knowledge is limited. It's hard to know sometimes with you because- I know I will have random knowledge. Yes. So, but I, but I will say, for, I mean, from what I have seen of alligators and read about alligators and watched, it's like, yeah, they're probably not going to uh, just come after you. I mean, they they could, they, they could. It depends on their size. There are some bigger ones, but they generally, they generally don't just randomly attack people. Okay, so it's probably highly unlikely that Tommy was in his boat and like the boat was attacked by a group no. of gators that knocked no. him out, and then he went uh -uh. in. They don't work in a group. Yeah, they're solo. Yeah. I literally don't know anything yeah, about alligators, they, they, they apparently. I, I have a stat for you. Okay. okay. In Florida, over the last 10 years, they've averaged eight unprovoked bites per year. So the likelihood okay. would be- Yeah, that's uh, super low. Super yeah, low. Yeah, one in 3.1 million. Oh, wow. Of getting Especially when you think about how many people live in Florida and how many like those alligators are around them. Right. Yeah. I, my cousin lives in Florida and they have a pool and I was just talking to my aunt because she was going to visit them. She's like, yep, I got to re-up my alligator awareness. Like, you know, before I let the dog out, I have to look. Before uh -huh. we go in the pool, I have to look. Before I take their son out, I have to look. I'm like, that seems like a lot of work to go outside. Yeah. Ugh. But, you know, whatever. You live where you live. Yeah. All right. Are you ready for three stories? I am. Okay. Let's dive in first about this haunted restaurant. Now, you never worked in a restaurant, did you? Mm -hmm. I worked in a few restaurants. One restaurant, one pizza place. Yeah, a pizza place. What was the restaurant? It was called like Moon something. It, it's, it's been long closed or Mars maybe. It was downtown Spokane. This is like late 90s. It's not even around anymore. It hasn't been around for years, but it was a nicer restaurant. No, I was terrible. I was what did, a, were you a waiter? No. Oh, okay, I was, I was yeah, I didn't supposed think to be so. a waiter. I worked there for the summer. I was a busboy. Okay. That they initially thought about promoting to waiter. Absolutely and then, not. And then reconsidered that. Yeah, I'm sure within- It was taken off the table. Yeah, I'm sure after day one, they were like, nope. I, I spilled stuff on people. I, I I fucked a lot of things up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that seems right. Mm -hmm. Well, as a former hospitality worker, uh, this story really messed me up. Okay. All right. My name is Ron, and this is my story about a haunted restaurant I used to run in Memphis. Now, just to say, I'm a big guy, a little over six feet tall, 245 pound, bearded, and tattooed. I'm hardly someone to get spooked, much let, much less alone, be scared beyond belief. It started off in a weird way, where I wasn't sure what was going on, but then it progressed to full-on terror. The layout of our restaurant is important. It's a relatively normal space, except we have an office that sits on top of the restaurant and can only be entered via a stairway located outside of the restaurant on the side of the building. It had a heavy door with a separate lock because this is where we did our paperwork, handled money, and so on. It was also where employees would hang out on their breaks because it was quiet and there was a TV in there. The first time that something happened, one of my employees was watching a basketball game waiting on his ride to pick him up, and I was finishing up my paperwork for the night. I told him it was time to wrap it up so we could all get going. Once I was done, I wanted to, I wanted to turn off the TV, but I couldn't find the remote. I was super tired, and I just wanted to go home, so I pulled the plug from the outlet, turning the TV off in this manner. And then I pulled the door closed tightly behind me, locked it, double-checked it to make sure no one could get in. I walked back downstairs, did my final walkthrough that takes, I don't know, two minutes. I set the alarm and I headed outside. I walked to where all of us park and a few of the cooks were still hanging around. One of them said, hey, Ron, you left the TV on upstairs. I looked up at the office and the TV was, in fact, on. I was exhausted and I just said, fuck it. I'll deal with it in the morning. I texted the opening manager in the morning to ask, hey, did I leave the TV on upstairs? And their reply was, no, it was not on and it was unplugged. Okay, it was weird, but whatever. Then, a few nights later, I was closing again. I did my paperwork, finished my deposit, did my walkthrough, and headed home. 
As I was driving home, I got a call from my district manager in a panic, asking me if everything was okay. I said, yeah, everything's fine. I'm in the car driving home now. He told me that the alarm company had called and stated that one of the alarms was tripped. I drove back to the restaurant and waited for a few minutes with my boss on the phone. From where I parked in front of the building, with the open kitchen concept we had there, I was able to see all the way to the back of the building. And I didn't see anything that stood out to me, so I decided to go in and see what was going on. Maybe I had forgotten to shut a door somewhere. Maybe I forgot to lock the drive through window. I don't know, but I was definitely going in and finding out. After I walked throughout the whole restaurant and noted that nothing was wrong or out of place, I went back to the alarm system keypad to reset it. There are six points of entry to our building, one of them being on the roof, and all of them showed an alert of an entry trip and all of them within 10 seconds of one another, as if to say that someone had run from door to door trying to get in as fast as possible, including the roof. I set the alarm and got the fuck out of there. My last week there, the worst thing happened, and thank God this time I wasn't alone. I was closing up with one of the cooks. We did a final walkthrough, everything looked great, and we were ready to head out. As we walked to the side door to leave, we both heard a huge bang coming from the back of the restaurant. Investigating where the sound might have come from, we opened the walk-in fridge to find that everything we had cooked and prepped was now thrown all over the walk-in cooler. Cakes that had been on the top shelf were thrown to the opposite side, 40-pound containers of cooked ribs were thrown from the top shelf of the storage racks, and all the salad dressings were now coating the floor of the walk-in. All of the shelves were completely intact. Nothing had fallen over. There was zero explanation for what had happened. And then the music came on. And the only way to turn the music on was upstairs in that locked office. We looked at each other, shook our heads, and left immediately. We both texted the GM of the store to tell him our crazy story and why we had left him such a mess and that we'd be back in the morning at open to help clean up. He replied, oh yeah, that ghost has been following me for years. Oh my God. In my last two weeks there, I requested to only work mornings or midday shifts. I never, ever wanted to be back in that restaurant alone at night again. From Creep, Ron. Thanks, Ron. What did that manager do to piss something off? I mean, and like also just so nonchalant, like, oh yeah, no big deal. What? Oh my God. My brain went to like, he killed somebody. Maybe. And that person's like is following him. Maybe that person's buried under the restaurant. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean- the very first thing that happened would be enough to just scare the hell out of me. And, and we've covered, covered this, you know, in numerous other stories. But whenever something uh, electronic starts working that doesn't mm-hmm. have batteries or isn't plugged in, yeah, that would freak me the hell out. Absolutely. Because there's no natural way. Like, like for a TV to be playing anything, it can't do that. Right. If it's unplugged. Right. Because it's not like it has a, you know, okay, with like an alarm clock radio, oftentimes it's like you can yeah. have it plugged in. And if you put batteries mm-hmm. in it, it's got battery backup. Like you can kind of string together some right. possibilities, but not a TV. Right. Yeah. Once a TV has been plugged off for a little while, yeah, it doesn't, it just, it's not able to come on unless something unnatural happens. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yee. And then just yeah, everything being thrown, like, man, what a violent, like, little moment in that uh, storage room. A uh, walk-in cooler. Or walk-in cooler, yeah. Where every- have you ever been in a walk-in cooler? Oh, I, yeah, you I went have. to the grocery store. They're uh-huh. so scary to me. Yeah? Yeah, because- Like, uh, like afraid of getting trapped in? Yeah, because not yeah. all of them have, I mean, if they're old, not all of them have the release from the inside. Yeah, yeah. More modern ones do, but- Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a story of a, a girl that worked at a fast food restaurant that died in a walk-in cooler. Oh, man. It must have been a walk-in freezer. I'm, I'm thinking, well, I guess if left long enough in the cooler, yeah, I mean, I guess you could die in there too. I don't know if it would be lack of air if you would get hypothermia because it's cold, but it's not right. freezing. Obviously, a freezer freezes. I, I just went back to working at the grocery store. It's like it, like it was just happening right now, but like going into the cooler and like stocking the beer and stuff. Yeah. And I was just trying to think if like the back of the door had uh-huh. a latch to, and it might not have, but then I was just imagining, I'm like, what I would do in that situation is I would just tear all the beer off a shelf and crawl out like one of the customer doors to access the beer. I would just pop out that way. Oh, 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 you're thinking of that. Okay, I'm thinking- But this is more of like a place where there is no windows. There's no, yeah, it's just in the back and it's just storing food and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. You're no thinking option. of like the- The beer cooler or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, but this, this is like a true uh, place to s- store refrigerated food. Mm-hmm. And yep, and there was just that big latch, just that big, heavy, heavy door. Yeah. And if you don't have a way to 
open up from the inside. That's weird that they ever designed it that way, actually, when you think about it. Well, they probably just thought, well, people aren't stupid enough to go into a cooler and close the door behind them. They'll prop the door open. Or they would Yeah, I, but just on the outside chance, it's just a, it's a weird initial design. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just like now, you know, trunks have the... A little latch thing to pop yourself out. Monroe's car is what, like a 2009? Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, the little like yellow thing hangs uh-huh. down and she's like, what is that? Because it like... Oh, yeah. In her experience, in her parents' cars, we've only had SUVs. Well, you can just push a button and it just... Well, also, you can't get trapped in a trunk of an SUV. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah Because yeah, you yeah, just yeah. climb over the seats. Yep, yep, exactly. So, like, it didn't... She was like, oh, yeah, cars have trunks. What happens if you can put in a trunk? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, no, this story, it just really freaked me out because, mm-hmm. you know, having to open or close a restaurant, it's, it's such a huge space and there's yeah. so much that needs to be done to open or close and you don't like you don't have time to like fuck around like uh-huh. you got to go in the cooler you got to get things going you got to cut you got to get the lemons to cut them like i don't know there's just so much that has to happen Ugh, so stressful mm-hmm. okay this is a very weird story okay okay let's go to san francisco hey dan and Lindsay. I wanted to share this very strange tale that happened to me many years ago and i was reminded of it when i heard another listener's tale about a haunted waitress I used to DJ at local clubs in and around the San Francisco Bay Area. It was a nice little side gig for me while I worked a 9 to 5. I would often DJ in the San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland areas on Thursdays through that through Saturday nights, doing multiple bars and clubs in a single night. When I first started, my friends would all tag along, have drinks, and then do it again with me the following night or the following week. It truly was not work for me. The money was good and the drinks were free. Mm. As I continued over the years, friends dropped off until it was just me going, and it eventually turned into just work. I often went, did my one or two hour short set, got paid, and went home. I worked so much that the nights and the days became a blur. One night on a Friday, I was particularly busy doing four one hour sets at four different clubs. It paid well, so I forced myself to do it. At the end of the night, I headed back home across the Bay Bridge. I realized I had not eaten dinner that night and actually hadn't even eaten since lunch. I recalled a diner called Buttercup Grill that was open 24-7 on my way home, a real greasy spoon type of place. I'd eaten there before and recalled how much I liked the pancakes. I pulled up to the parking lot, no other cars, Actually, no one really on the street, but it was sort of a bad part of the neighborhood, which usually had people wandering about at all hours of the day and night, but the streets were unusually empty tonight. The light was on, and I saw someone inside behind the counter. It was about 2.45, and all the clubs had just let out. This place should have been packed. I sat down and was, and was greeted by the friendly waitress that told me she was the only one working that night, grill and waitstaff. I felt bad for her, and I made my order as easy as possible and planned to tip her well. I got my pancakes, housed them, and then had small conversations with her as she walked around the restaurant, cleaning and doing other random tasks. She'd been working there for just a few weeks, working at night and going to school during the day. She was really kind and easy to talk to. She disappeared to the back, but she had left my check for me. It was close to 3.45, and I needed to get home. I left my payment with an extra-large cash tip, yelled out thank you, and walked out. I hopped in my car, drove home, passed out. I woke up the next day a little bit later than usual, and my roommate, who'd been up for a while, asked me how my night had gone. I asked him if he'd ever eaten at that particular diner. He said, oh yeah, a few times before they closed it. Oh, well, they just reopened it or something. I said, no, bro, it's been closed for over a year. I told him that I ate there last night. And then we continued to exchange, no, it's not, yes, it is, for several minutes. And then he told me I should just go drive by and check out if it's open or not. I got ready for the day and decided to drive by on my way to run errands. It was just right off the freeway. I made my way back to the diner, and lo and behold, it was all boarded up. It actually looked like it hadn't been open in years. Graffiti on the walls, the neon sign was cracked, exposing the bulbs underneath it, tons of overgrowth in the parking lot, which was chained off with a single link chain that wouldn't have kept a bicycle out. I could not find anything on why the restaurant had closed. People had speculated there had been a fire or that the location was bad and the owner closed it down. I have no explanation on how I ended up there, ate food, and paid for it. My money was missing, the amount that I had tipped plus the bill. At this point in my life, I'd already stopped drinking, so I knew it wasn't anything that would have impaired my memory. The only thing I can think of is that I was really, really tired and that I somehow walked into another restaurant and ate there and that 
I might have gone and that the one I might have gone to was the one up the street. But that one was always full of people, which it was when I drove past that night after I ate at the other place. There was no way I could have mistaken the two. Was there? One was very dark and small, and the other one was the size of a Denny's. I couldn't mix them up, could I? I have no idea what happened to me that night or where I really went. Michael. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. That is a good weird one. It's so it's like strange. Twilight Zone. It reminds me of that um, hotel that was missing. We have like a mother-daughter uh-huh, story. Like a year or two in ago. In Oregon. Yeah. Yep. yep that's what I was, it reminded me of that too. Yeah. But that's wild. Like, I listen, I have been really exhausted in my life. Yeah. You know, I, I think we all have. And like mistakenly remember like doing things. Okay. Yeah. But going into a restaurant, having conversation, right. eating, yeah, eating, paying, and missing that amount of money. So it wasn't like he definitely right. went somewhere and ate. And then when he's comparing the two places, like uh-huh. the Buttercup Grill versus this other place, tiny, large, bright and yep. full of people, yep. dark, and remembers yeah. driving past the other place after eating at Buttercup uh-huh. and, be, and, and like mentally noting like, oh, it's so busy there. Where the fuck did he go? He slipped back in time. Yeah, who knows? That, that, that is, uh, yeah, I would... Who knows? Truly a mystery. That, that's something you're never going to figure out. Would that drive you crazy? Oh, yeah. I, w- I would be reflecting on that night uh, here and there for the rest of my life. How could you not? How could you not? Because you, your mind just wants to resolve things like that. We're just, we're, uh, your mind is built to like, we're want, we're, we want to solve puzzles. puzzles. Yeah. Humans, it's, it's why like, uh, it's actually why conspiracies exist. One of the big reasons. We don't like not knowing. Sure. You know, uh, and, and and we don't like, you know, if certain answers don't fit our narrative, we want, our mind wants to just be like, well, there must be this. Mm-hmm. We, we don't like just uh, throwing our hands up and being like, I don't know, it's just a mystery. It's very unsettling uh, of course. For, for some people more than others. And it's like, um, yeah, something like that. It's like, he did everything he could. He went back to the location. You know, he thought about his night more, you know, before, and there's nothing else that can be done. It's not like, um, I'm sure you'd have like little moments of like, uh, was that some sort of weird like joke? Did they yeah. fix this place up really quick for one night? Was it some kind of thing that I missed? But it's like, but that's impossible because it wouldn't look decrepit the next day. It wouldn't have graffiti all over the next day. That is, that would be a wild, okay, you have endless amounts prank. of money, yeah. okay? And like a good place to do that is like a roadside truck stop, coffee shop kind uh-huh. of vibe, right? Uh-huh. And if you could keep the outside looking like trash while you fix up the inside. Oh my God, yeah. And then just like, I don't even, you'd have to move so quickly. Cut the grass. Okay, but he said it was overgrown the next day. I know. But you still could. You still could. Okay, you could like clear out a parking lot, take down the boards, have it open for one night, and then board it back up. Because there would be Uh people who came in who could never find it again. I mean, you would have people who would definitely see what happened. And the internet is a wild place, so they would eventually piece it together. But God, that would be a great joke for like, a little while. I know that would be like like a hidden camera prank show. I don't, I don't know how you because you couldn't guarantee that the people would come back the next day, but that would be so interesting to t- take some place that's been closed for like yeah a year, two years, three years, and then real quick have a crew go clean everything up really fast. Get oh get gosh. like retro outfits. I love this. Have like a staff fake customers. So there's like people that talk about their regulars there. Everything they're joking with the wait staff, and then like uh, I don't know. You could have you, you you know what you could do is you could mess with a friend. Oh yeah, and then you can be like, "Hey man, let's go cr- try this. Uh, try this diner and whatever like that." You bring them to the diner, and then the next day when they talk about it, be like, "We didn't go to a diner. <laughs> like, what are you talking about?" Oh my gosh, it'd be so hysterical. And like, yeah, we did. No, we didn't. That place has been closed forever. And then drive them back there and watch them just lose their shit. We're like, I swear to God, we were here. I was talking to you. Wow. You had the hot turkey sandwich. Oh my gosh, that would be so fun. That would be. That would be an incredible prank. Yeah. Is your album Chinese Affection widely available? Or is it still uh, only- digital, Digitally, yeah, for sure. Because in that one, you talk about like if you had tons of money. Oh yeah, the laser rocket. Yeah, the, the yeah, crazy- yeah. How many weird, uh-huh. bizarre infomercials you would do just <laughs> true, for true. fun jokes. Yeah, yeah. That, and, and actually, I think all my stuff is still on YouTube. And it looks like it might get back on Pandora, fingers crossed, Sirius XM. We're working on it. Yeah, we're working on it. But um, we're doing all the things. But at the very least, everything's on YouTube. Don't worry. Your manager's on it. Good job. <laughs> okay. Last one? Last one. Okay, here we go. Uh, This one, just to remind you, haunted house or attachment? Okay. Okay. Hello, my name is Jesse, and I hope my story will help people feel like they're not insane or alone. I'm picturing the Toy Story right now, just so you know. Oh, the cute little cowgirl? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Little Jesse from the Toy Story. Cute. 2010. It was my senior year of high school. Everything was in my hands, and I was on top of the world. 
Six months after finishing school, I was working and having the time of my life until it all shifted. Sorry, I should say it was my senior year of school, Mm. not high school. One day at work, I worked at a school. I saw a little boy outside of my window, but I thought nothing of it, assuming some kids were outside for gym time. When it was our turn to go outside, a child in my class was standing behind a tree, just staring. Hey, bud, what are you doing? I asked him. He replied, the boy over there wanted to play with me. And he pointed to absolutely nothing. I asked him to describe the boy, thinking he had a bright imagination and I could feed his creativity. But then he described the exact little boy I had seen earlier that morning. I was confused more than anything. Did the little boy run off? Was he a student? Was he in some kind of trouble? I had no answers. About three weeks later, strange things began to happen at my house. My two dogs are pretty much mute unless I'm walking them and someone approaches me. They're trained to protect me. Otherwise, they're quiet and they lay low and they've been like that since they were rescued. My dogs and I were in the living room when they started howling at absolutely nothing except the corner of the ceiling. Hair sticking up, they were backing up towards me and then they sat by my feet and the howling turned to whining. Moments later, I heard a huge crash upstairs. Right above the living room is my bedroom. Boom, 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 three times. I walked upstairs and found multiple pictures had been ripped off my walls and thrown 10 feet across the room. Then I was taking a shower one evening a few weeks later, and the shower had those sliding glass doors. When I was finished, I grabbed the door in order to open it and screamed when I saw the little boy from my school through the glass. The same boy the child in my class had described. I threw the door open quickly. Absolutely nothing. He was gone. My mom was staying with me at the time, and I was grateful to not be alone. I eventually was able to calm down enough to fall asleep. I awoke to what sounded like Velcro being pulled apart, but very slowly. Getting annoyed that maybe my dogs had gotten into something, I sat up to yell at them. But I found the dogs were not there. But my mom was, and she was standing next to my bed. I was so confused. Mom? What's wrong? What are you doing? No reply. I asked again. Still no reply. I leaned in closer to my mom, and that's when I saw nothing but a blacked out face. I screamed at the top of my lungs, and my mom came running into my room. After this, I began to look for help. I found a woman who offered to come sage my house. I told her of the events, and she came with sage and lots of prayers. After she finished, things quieted down in my home for a few months until I had my friends over for a wine and chick flick night. My friend Kristen went upstairs to use the restroom, and when she returned, she said, hey, I didn't know your brother was staying here. And I replied, what? He's not. Well, I went upstairs to use your bathroom, and I walked past the guest bedroom, and there was a man in there staring out the window. My heart dropped. I hadn't told anyone what was going on because it sounded so insane. I ignored it, and I ended the conversation, and I, so I didn't scare anyone or look like a fool. Our girls' night of one night turned into them staying all weekend, which made me feel a tad bit better, just knowing that if something happened, I wouldn't sound like I'd lost my mind. The second night of what was now our girls' weekend, it began again. Waiting for dinner to be delivered, we had a lifetime murder mystery on, when out of nowhere, we heard a pounding coming from the closet door. It was so loud, it sounded like police were coming through my front door. We sat there with our jaws on the floor, holding each other, shaking until it stopped. We waited a few seconds, and then it started up again. I got really brave, and I opened the closet doors, only to find nothing there. That next day, I asked my neighbor more about my house. Whose house was the first on the land? What was there before our development? And so on. He simply told me it had been a farm of cotton and corn. I researched online for weeks at home, at work. I couldn't sleep anymore. I was becoming obsessed with finding answers. I was able to get a Wiccan woman to come to my house, but it only angered whatever was there. When I was finally brave enough to sleep again, I moved my entire bedroom to the basement, thinking, I don't know, maybe the room itself was haunted? But I was absolutely wrong. I woke up with my face pressed into the bed with what felt like a hand holding the back of my neck, trying to choke me from behind. And when I was able to get up and turn around, the woman with the blacked out face was next to my bed again. I'd had enough. I sought out someone else to come over and cleanse my house. She had candles and crystals everywhere. Lights out. We did this thing. I'm not sure what she did exactly, but it was gone for good. It felt like a a weight had lifted off my chest as the darkness disappeared from my home. She told me that what she got from this entity was that it was evil and was using the image of a little boy to get close to me because I was a school teacher and prone to kindness towards children. 
It had been a year since this all happened. I have since moved in with my boyfriend and all was back to normal. But it all came rushing back one night like a football team had tackled me. I had fallen asleep on the couch as my boyfriend had worked that night. My dog's whining woke me from my sleep and the basement door slammed shut for absolutely no reason. I pulled the blanket over my head and my dogs were now lying on top of me, shaking. I lied there, waiting, praying. And then I heard, hey, hey you. I simultaneously screamed and jumped up to turn on the lights. I saw a black figure by the basement door. Did someone break in? Was the entity back? Was I having some kind of PTSD? I called my boyfriend, hysterically crying. And as I do, the power goes out. He was telling me it's just the breaker box. I just need to go in the basement and flip the switch. Of course, I refused. I mentioned something to his sister and his mom who had lived in that house prior to us owning it. They turned white and began apologizing, saying they had had stuff happen to them as well. We called a psychic and the psychic came over and said a little boy lived there and had died there and was buried in the walls. My entire body was flushed, hot, panicking. Was it the same little boy I saw at work? Did he latch on to me? To this day, we still hear things around the house. My boyfriend will see a shadow person from time to time over the course of a year, and he's also woken up with scratch marks down his back with dried blood. I've also woken up to cuts on my legs. Things seem to be intensifying. With a psychic, sage, crystals and prayers, this thing is not budging. I just hope every day we can save enough money and leave, and it doesn't follow me. Yee yee. I wonder if she brought it to the school from her place. Oh, like initially? Uh huh. Like, may, like, may, like maybe she didn't seen it because just because she said that other people had, like, I think she said her oh, mom, like other uh, people had seen stuff in that same house before she saw that thing come up from the basement. But that was things. the second house. So first she lives alone. First she lives alone. Yeah, is a teacher sees. Uh, something at school. At school. Another little kid sees it. Mm -hmm. Another little kid sees it first. Then she sees it. No, she sees it oh, she first. she saw it first? She oh, okay. saw it first. She sees a little boy outside her window, thinks that that kid is having gym class outside. Then it's her class's turn to go outside and a little boy in her oh, classroom. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. I mean, I don't really know if like those, I don't know if the chronological order yeah, yeah, yeah. truly matters, yeah. but- but then, but then things start happening at her house. So first she sees it at school and then things start happening at her house first where place. she lives alone. Uh-huh. And then, uh, then, you know, she tries all the things Excuse me. She tries yeah. all the things and then she moves in with her boyfriend and all seems okay. So, I, and I'm with her. I would think too, like, okay, it must've been that place that I lived, whether it was at my yeah. house and I took it to school or it was at or school and I took it to my house. It was there. And now I'm at my boyfriend's and everything's fine until it's not. And then, okay. And then at that house, the mom, the, her, let's just say mother-in-law for yeah. ease, the mother-in-law and sister-in-law are like, oh shit, we have also seen things here. So- my question would be, was she dating her boyfriend this entire time? Was like, was she occasionally sleeping at his house? Was it from his house? And then she and then it attached to her, which would give it the ability to be at her apartment where she lived alone and at her school. And then it comes full circle when she goes back to her boyfriend's house. Did it originate there anyways? Right, because that's where the boy died. Was it that location? That's what the psychic says. The psychic says, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And it could be multiple things, really. Unfortunately, Jesse, you could just be prone yeah. to being able to see these things. Yeah, I forgot. Sorry, my fog brain a little bit um, it gives me a little trouble tracking, but now- but No that, worries, that, I get it. But that's right, uh, where that house that she ends up in, the second house, she she had a relationship in a, in a way with that house before she went there because it was her boyfriend's family's house. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they were definitely dating the entire- like, I don't know, oh, that's but, my but, question. Because okay, okay. that, would, that would- That would make sense. Piece it all together. Yeah, that would piece it all together because- uh, or if, if that's not it, then it's like, I guess, one hell of a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> you saw one little spirit here and then saw another little spirit over there, or I don't know. I don't know. I, I like I like your premise that it was originates with the boyfriend's house. Mm -hmm. They were dating when she lived at the previous place. And that's how this thing showed up at her job when she worked when she lived at the first house. Yeah. That yeah. seems like the that would easiest. Be the, the, that would be the easiest connection between uh -huh. everything. So Jesse, listen, if you're still dating this guy but you don't like him, uh -huh. you could break up with him and just say like, you know what, <laughs> too buddy? Much. Sorry, too many things attached to you. I got to go. And then move again and pray to God nothing happens. <laughs> and if you love him, well, then, you know, just stay and you'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> that, that's that's it. Uh, 
So they did determine, I don't know, or I feel like they determined through the psychic that there was like this kid there, but they have tried, sounds like various rituals and can't get the kid out. I yeah. guess you would just keep trying, like bring in a priest, bring in a pastor, bring, yeah. like, you know, bring in everybody you can bring in to try to like cleanse your, cleanse your home. Yeah. Hope for the best. Yeah. I know it's not always that easy. And like she says, like, you know, I hope to God we can save enough money to get out of here. Because sometimes you're just a victim of your circumstances. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what's happening. You know why it's happening. And there ain't shit you can do about it. That would be quite the relationship test. Like, Oof. how much do I like this person? If if uh, if I feel confident that I can leave and not be bothered by this entity, <laughs> but if I stay, I'm going to continue to be bothered by this entity. It's like, is, is being bothered by this entity worth being in this relationship? Quite the uh, test. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like you like a lot. Mm -hmm. But if I had, if I had so many demonic attachments, I don't know, man. That yeah. would be tricky. Like that's like a weird like what if. Like okay, you get to be with the person of your dreams, um, but every time you have sex with them and uh, look up past their shoulder, there's a little demon back there. Oh my gosh! Every single time you have sex, a little demon's watching you. Like, <laughs> is, it, is it worth it? It depends how good that sex is. I know. It's like best sex of your yes, life. It's the best sex Every ever. Every fantasy but... you've ever had satisfied. I mean, like uh -huh. we got a lot of boxes to check off. Mm -hmm. But then following that sex. I'd stay. You'd stay? <laughs> With <laughs> Me you? Too. Me too. Me too. Uh, but yeah, man, that's, yeah. A great story. That was. That was. Yeah. Good story and, today. And I'm I'm sorry if it's still happening. Yeah. Ay, 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 ay. Okay. Well, there we go. Well, there we go. Let's get out of here. Okay. Do you want to uh, thank the Annabelles first or me? <laughs> sure, I'll go first. Uh, thank you to the following Annabelles for helping us to donate to Truckers Against Trafficking and just keeping us afloat here yeah. at Bad Magic. Aurora, Chelsea Evans, very cool spelling, Chelsea, Angela, uh, Angela Knapp, Jansen, Kathleen Lobner, Brittany Porter, Leah Dinky Glossick, <laughs> Elizabeth, I, you, <laughs> I know, I'm like, is that right? Yeah. Elizabeth Blackwood, Brandy Warden, and Erica Guerrero. Thank you, Annabelle. I'd like to thank the following Annabelle's as well. Emily Mueller, Mel Tist, Angela Johnson, Gavin Dittrich, or D Dittrich? D Dietrich. Dietrich? Dietrich. There's no E in there, but okay. Gavin Dietrich. Um, Casey Sally. Dietrich. Uh, Chris Kittner, Trisha Boyer, Jonathan Obregon, Gracie, and Them Feathers Brother. Them Feathers Brothers. You didn't put an S on it, so I, maybe Them Feathers Brothers. I think so. Okay, okay. I just like Them Feathers Brother. <laughs> uh, or Them Feathers Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joel Feathers. And now for some spooky shout outs. All right. To Ebony, the most mercurial creeper from Mother, Father, and Aria. Happy 12th birthday. We love you more than you can ever understand. Slay Queen. <laughs> To Eva from your mom, Danielle, happy birthday and thanks for tolerating Scared to Death with me. To Haley from Micah, happy birthday, sweet cheeks. I love you and I wish you a great day. To Yegs from Yegs, it, it, like it's to Yegs from Yegs from Dada, <laughs> Diddy, Bot Bot, and Bear Bear, happy birthday. Y'all got some crazy ass nicknames in that house. To Marcy from Andy, happy birthday. You somehow look more beautiful with each passing day. Oh, come on, Marcy. Andy's a good one. Don't let him go. <laughs> very, very sweet. Uh, that's our show. Hopefully my voice will be back to normal this next time. It, it sounded 1000% it fine. It did sound yeah. pretty good. It just like, I hear like, like cough or whatever, that little rattle. Uh -huh. just, oh, it's, I was good. I was, I was healthy for like one day and then I caught something else. Well, we made the mistake of getting a massage. We had like these massages scheduled. We had gift certificates to cover the cost. Mm -hmm. It was like a whole thing. We're like, ah, yep. oh. and you, you Holy were- Holy backfire. We were feeling, so, we were like, oh, this is great. And we, I should have thought about it. I know better than to like do that. But I think it's just like anything that was pent up and we just released all the toxic toxins and Something. didn't drink enough water. And then we pushed it too hard, too fast. We saw friends three days in a row, plus a massage. And that was it. Yeah. Back down we went. Back to being sick. Uh, thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else. Info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith for editing, publishing today's show. Thanks to Heather Rylander organizing the My Story emails. Booked editor Drew Atana polishing and preparing listener stories for book number five. Thank you to Olivia Lee for finding both of the stories I told this week. 
We're on YouTube if you want to watch a show. We're on Facebook and Instagram uh, if you want to see the pics that uh, accompany the episodes. And if you want to see Dan's amazing finishing school, like the things that happened to him, go to YouTube and watch this episode. I mean, Mm -hmm. you've never seen such a dignified Mm -hmm. gentleman. Yeah. Just remember, pinkies out, back straight. Good day, sir. Uh, yeah, the, the <laughs> don't forget to bow when you finish. <laughs> the Instagram and Facebook is at Scared to Death Podcast. We have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, full of fellow horror lovers. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> if spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. The word that gets thrown around mostly about me is refined. He's a refined gentleman. Yeah, I think sometimes they say like he's very well put together. Dignified. 